It wasn't working very well yesterday um, in CISP440, but it seems to be working now. So the mic is good on both sides, and the other side or YouTube is you know, streaming now. So I'm going to disable that browser, close that browser. All right. So we got about three minutes and a half. I finally finished grading. It, it took a really long time because I timed myself. I was able to grade maybe three exams per hour. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty slow. And, uh, but that's because I was reading every single line of reasoning in the answers and trying to connect, you know, all the dots, connect all the logic and evaluate whether the explanation is sufficient or not. So that, it, it's, it takes, it takes time. So I will show you guys what, um, is next regarding that. Okay. Alright, so I'm gonna get my Discord text channel up so I can see it on the side. <clears throat> and just like my other class, I am using you know, Joplin. So this is Joplin. Um, I talked about this at the beginning of the semester and mentioned this as a potential uh, note taking tool. And I'm using it to take some notes you know, before the lecture. Um, so it's, um, you're right, Matty, or Nicholas. Yep. I have not started a streaming on this court's side. There we go. Now it should be streaming. There we go. <clears throat> you should see it now. <laughs> All right. So what you are seeing is, um, Joplin. So I talked about Joplin at the very beginning of the semester, you know, of, you know, what tools you can use to take notes, especially on the computer. And Joplin is also available on mobile devices, but I really don't think that you want to take notes using a on-screen um, keyboard. I am particularly bad with a thumb keyboard and, you know, I just cannot position my thumb pad on the thumb keyboard very well. So I, I, have, have, I have a lot of uh, mis typos and other kinds of mistakes. I need a real keyboard in order to type stuff like this. So let me check the time. We got one minute to go. So exam one is graded, uh, but it's not entered into the system yet. So it's going to take a little bit of time to, um, to do that. Yeah, I got a question from a student from another class. So I'm going to have to ignore that for now. That's the one thing about this court that can be distracting is, you know, in the middle of a synchronous class, I might get some students, you know, direct message from another class. And until I actually, you know, hover over the icon or the avatar, I would not be able to tell, you know, who that student is. <clears throat> so, let's see. We got another 15 seconds. So I'm not really sure what kind of tool you guys use to take notes um, or whether some people are taking notes or not. But I, I hope everybody in this class understand that taking notes is important. Um, although occasionally I suspect, you know, certain people do not take notes because they cannot, because they're not even here. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, handwritten notes can be useful, you know, and um, not sure whether you can integrate that into Joplin. I suspect you can do that using um, an attachment of an image file or something along that line. All right. Okay. So it is time. So uh, I'm not I'm not going to classify this as good or bad news. It is news. Uh, the grading of exam one is done. Um, I have everything handwritten. Um, onto a PDF copy of the exams. So I have all my notes. I have all my you know, rationale of you know what I think of this reasoning, what I think of that reasoning, and so on. When everything is good, I just put a check. Um, if there are certain things that I think, hmm, this seems to be wrong, or this seems to be missing, then I'll actually hand write you know, the notes um, in the exam. So that would be shared with you so that you know how I graded it. Um, 
and then I'll enter the scores into a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet will do all the calculations for me, and also send out you know the individual scores of the individual parts of every single question that you answer uh, for the part that you have chosen. Some people did not indicate which uh, portion of the questions they want to answer, and I'll just take the first section that was actually answered. And then after that, um, after the spreadsheet has done all the calculations, the congregated value will be entered into Canvas. So that would be the last step, which is um, officially I need that to calculate the final grade for everybody in this class. But you would get an email, you know, of the complete breakdown of all the points. Um, yes, that actually takes me a little bit of time to um, to come up with that tool to work the way it does now. Uh, but it's automated at that point. Um, right now, I still need to go through, go back and go through every single paper and enter the grade into the spreadsheet. So that's going to be the tedious part. It will all be done by Thursday. Okay. Um, you know, depending on how busy I get today in the lab, I might be able to do it today. Some, you know, some of it at least, and or you know, it depends. Anyway, uh, we are now back to. Um, text toy processor. And last time we talked about the RAM component as well as the ROM component. There are only two, I would call it two and a half uh, components that we still have to go over. Uh, the first one is a multiplexer. But before we go there, I'm going to explain what is now when you look at Joplin on my screen, I would like you to focus on the right hand side because this is the finished product. What is on the left hand side is called um, mark down okay it is you know it's sort of what you see is what you get but not entirely because you know this is the actual notation this is what I type in order to generate what you see on the right hand side so you can focus on the right hand side when I type on the left hand side so Joplin is pretty cool I was using it to uh, I was experimenting with it a little bit in CISP 440 yesterday and um, it's very easy to enter math equations into it. So, you know, you can consider this as an alternative way to um, take notes. Okay, so I think, Matt, you have some background noise and your mic is unmuted. So you might want to mute yourself. Sorry about that. No problem. Just want to let you know. Yeah, there was one meeting with the union that I did not know that my mic was actually uh, connected and I was eating something that was really loud so you know so everybody heard me chewing and slurping and stuff like that so it happens to everybody yeah I'm eating <laughs> toast so that's perfect <laughs> it's a union meeting of all things too so yeah so there were like 20 plus people in that particular meeting um, and I was a new member at the time too so I guess I made my uh, presence felt for sure <laughs> all right so getting back to the remaining components so high z is an important concept it is called high impedance because z is the symbol for impedance in electronic circuits it is analogous to r which is resistance but z is for ac circuits or circuits that you know have the signal changing and then r is more like for dc signal where it is stationary um <laughs> yeah I, next time i'll try coin nuts um so getting back to high z so what when a port in is in high z mode it means it's not trying to specify a one or zero it is as if the port is actually functionally not connected to the physically connected node so this is important because the node is actually always physically connected to the node because there's no easy way um, to disconnect a port from the conductor that is soldered to on the motherboard okay that's just not going to be done easily however you know by using electronics we can make a port functionally not connected in other words it does not care about what is you know whether it's a one or zero you know at that particular node nor is it trying to specify a zero or one it is basically saying don't care which is actually a technical term. Don't care is actually a technical term when we design uh, electronic, uh, when we specify electronic components. Don't care means, you know, high Z is basically a don't care. All right. Um, so getting back to the control buffer that we talked about last time, uh, 
So I'm using the object oriented way to specify this. So CB is basically an object that belongs to the class of controlled buffer. It has three ports. It has in, out, and en for enable. The behavior of a, of a controlled buffer is as follows. So CB.out is going to get the following value. And some of you know how much I like ternary operator or ternary expressions. This is a ternary expression. It means if en is true, which means it is non-zero, then cb.in is the value of the entire ternary expression. So that means in that case, when en is a 1, cb.out would be the same as cb.in. Basically, we are mirroring whatever the input port is you know, to the output port. Then the next question is, what if en is not a 1? What if it is a 0? If en is a 0, then we use the last value or the last value of the ternary expression, which in this case is high z, which is, ex as explained earlier, it is high impedance. So the output port, it would be in high impedance mode when the en port is a 0. It is completely ignoring what the input port is, is trying to specify. Instead, the output port is simply saying, don't care. Okay, you know, It is as if I'm not connected to the conductor on the circuit board. So I'm using this notation to go back to explain what a controlled buffer is. So now, with this terminology, we can now try to explain what a multiplexer is and also what a demultiplexer is. And by the way, this is just an alternative explanation because as I suggested in class, um, you can also use the online help of Logisim. I'm just trying to locate the online help here. So this is the uh, actual processor, but you can go to help, and then you go to library reference, and let me drag it out here, and then go, go, go to plexers, and under plexer is multiplexer. This is the explanation of what a multiplexer is, and then you can also look at what is a demultiplexer. I forgot one thing, which is a decoder, but the decoder is very easy to explain. Once you know what is a demultiplexer, the, the decoder is like, oh, okay, so it's a special case. It's a subclass of a demultiplexer. I'll explain that in just a little bit. So I'm hoping most of you have had the time to read up on what is a multiplexer and what is a demultiplexer before class today. If you don't, then you can still sort of depend on how I'm explaining all of this using uh, JavaScript and C code. Okay, um, the reason why I call this in JavaScript, you can see how in the um, program listing I you know, classify this as JavaScript because I am borrowing an operator from JavaScript. It's called in. So the in operator is checking whether a particular member, in this case en, is in a particular object, which in this case is the is the variable mux. But before we get there, I'm going to explain what is a multiplexer. A multiplexer has two to the power of n input ports, an, an n bit selector, an optional en for enable, and a single output. So I'm going to follow this tradition here, and I'm going to change this a little bit just so that I can spell out the whole word of enable, except you know, the first part is the part that where the, uh, the abbreviation of the port is uh, using. Um, and then the behavior of the multiplexer mux is as follows. So mux is basically here is the name of a variable, you know, which is a multiplexer object. So I'm using the object-oriented method to explain the behavior of a multiplexer. It is using a single um, assignment operator. So here's my you know, single assignment operator. And mux dot out, okay, basically, you know, we're trying to determine what is the output of the multiplexer depends on this condition. So this condition is, uh, it looks a little bit complicated. It's basically a implication, okay? So for those of you, I know some of you are taking CISP 440 from me, so you probably, hopefully, you know, recognize this as a disguised implication. So what it means is, um, if en is indeed in multiplexer, we also want it to be actually enabled. Or if en is not in in the multiplexer, in other words, you know, because the en, the enable pin, is optional, so in some of the multiplexers, is not there. So in either case, okay, if en is not in mux, or in the case that it is in mux and it is actually enabled, then 
this is this is the value that we use to determine the output of a multiplexer. So as earlier described, um, we have multiple input ports and an n bit selector. So the selector is always within range of you know, being an array index within the array of n because we have two to the power of n um, elements in the array. But the selector can only go from 0 all the way up to 2 to the power of n minus 1. So that means you know, no matter what the value of the selector is, it is always within range of being an index to the array. So all we are doing is we are using the selector to choose which one of the input pin is actually connected to the output port of the multiplexer. So now the question is, how do we get to the high Z here? Okay, so the high Z is basically the else value of the entire ternary op expression. So that would be when this thing is false. So the question is, um, how does this thing become false? There are two reasons. There, there's only one reason why it can become false. Um, e n in mux has to be uh, has to be true because otherwise the negation would not be false. So EN has to be in MUX and also we also want uh, EN to be false itself because you know this is a disjunction so we need both sides to be false in order for the whole thing to be false. So that means if there is actually an EN pin and the EN pin is a zero then the output port is going to be in high impedance mode. So are we okay with this description? All right. So other than this in operator, which is what I borrowed from JavaScript to check whether a member is actually in an object or not, in this case, I'm checking whether the enable pin is part of this multiplexer because after all, it is optional. So other than that, this is straight out C. Okay, even though I say it's JavaScript, it is actually, I would say, 85% uh, actual C because JavaScript borrowed a lot of syntax from see. I'm going to stop a little bit, pause, and see if there are any questions. And if you really want to uh, make it more concrete, you can, instead of using n as a, you know, uh, as a variable, you can say, what if n equals to 2? If n equals to 2, that means we have four input ports. And then the selector is going to have two bits, which is which makes sense because with two bits you can specify 0 0 which is the value of 0 0 1 which is the value of 1 1 0 which is the value of 2 and then 1 1 which is the value of 3 in other words with uh, n being 2 the selector can only specify the values known to us as 0 1 2 or 3 so there are four values we can specify using the selector. But there are also only four input ports because n is 2, 2 to the power of 2 is 4. So that means we have one selector value for every input port, which makes this thing possible. We specify which input connects to the only output of the multiplexer. The only complication coming from this expression is whether there's an enable or not. If there's no enable, that means there's no way to turn it off, which means you know whatever you specify as the select is always connected to the output. In the presence of an enable pin, then we can use the enable pin to basically go, okay, if it is enabled, then we just connect whatever input is being specified or selected to the output. But if the enable pin is a zero, then we'll just you know make the output high impedance. That's basically what a multiplexer uh, is going to do. And since there are no questions in the text channel, we're going to move on to a demultiplexer. A demultiplexer is exactly the opposite. Even the code to, to describe it, it looks a little more complicated. It is actually the same thing, except it's in the opposite direction. So a demultiplexer has two to the power of n output ports, an n bit selector, and an optional enable, and a single input port. So it's basically exactly the opposite, okay? It only has one input, but multiple output. But guess what? It's the same thing. We are trying to select which one of the output ports is connected to the only input port here. So the behavior of a demultiplexer demux as an object is as follows. So this time I have to use a loop because we have to look at every single port, uh, every single output port of a 
uh, demultiplexer and determine you know what it is supposed to do. So I have a local variable i here. I could have used the int i in here, but since I'm trying to do it as much uh, closer to C instead of C++. Uh, in C++, you can put int i equals to zero inside the for expression, but in C, you have to put it outside. The outermost um, braces is here because you know, I just want to make i a local variable, local to this scope, because otherwise it, you know, it has no particular use. So inside, okay, inside the loop for each iteration, we want to focus on this particular uh, nested ternary expression because there are two ternary expressions here. One is nested within the other one, but don't worry. I'll help you analyze, you know, this one, and you know, hopefully, you know, you would also learn how to do this on your own at some point. And I'm just counting parentheses here to make sure that they all look good. Yep, they all look good. All right, so let's go ahead and tackle this particular. Um, seemingly difficult um, ternary expression. So as with um, anything, you can either go from the outside in or go from the inside out. But the ordering of operations always from the outside in, which is what I'm going to do here. So we know i is going to be um, from, oh, let me see. That is correct. OK, so i is going to be, um, oh, by the way, one more thing uh, before I go any further. This is one left shifted n times, and n is the end that I specify here. So basically, I'm just you know making a boundary, you know, of how large I can be before we get out of the loop. Um, left shift is in binary, so one left shift operation is going to shift in a zero when we look at an integer as in in binary, and it's going to move all the bits to the left hand side by one position. That is called a left shift operation. I was kind of hoping that CISP360 would actually talk about the left shift operator, but that appear, appears not to be the case in some, you know, uh, in some instances of the CISP360 classes. Uh, and then Matt said we can also start with at zero and plus one. Well, we're always starting with zero because um, zero refers to the zeroth, you know, the first port of the of the output, and we have the post increment plus plus one here, and that's why I use a for loop. Oh, okay, gotcha. All right, gotcha, gotcha. So when n is two, okay, one left shifted twice is going to be one zero zero in base two. And that means it is specifying a value of four, so that would be correct because you know when you have um, two bits, you know, as the selector, then you have four ports, four output ports in this case to consider. All right, so for for each iteration, we know i is going to be a valid index. So for each output port, we're going to decide what it should be doing using this ternary operate nested ternary expression here. The first question to ask is whether this is true or not. And if you say, but heck, we have seen this before. It's we, we are just changing mux to dmux. Then congratulations, you have been paying attention and understanding the concepts. So all this is saying is um, if there is an en and the en is, a, is true, then do the following. Or if there's no en, if the demultiplexer has no enable pin, also do the following. So what is in the following? This is the following, which is by itself also a ternary expression. So this ternary expression is now comparing to see if the uh, output port is matching the selector. If it does match, okay, then we just go like, okay, whatever the input pin is, there's only one input pin in this case, becomes the output pin, the output port that is indexed by i, because you know that's this is the ultimate. Uh, uh, destination of the assignment operator. What if it's not? What if i does not equal to the selector value? Then we're going to use this one here. This is the nested. Oh, this is like the the third level of nested um, ternary expression. So at this point, all we need, all we know, is um, en may not be in dmux, or if it is, then en is is true. And we also know that i does not equal to the selector value. In other words, we are talking about an output port where 
its index does not match you know, what is being selected. So what do we do? Okay, we have an output port, it is not selected, and um, either there's, there's an enable pin and it is on, or there's no enable pin whatsoever. So depending on whether the enable pin is there or not, okay, if it is, then we output, you know, we specify high Z, high impedance, which is basically saying, you know, if EN is present and it is turned on, but your, you being the output port is not the one being selected, I'll just tell you to shut up, okay? Don't say a word, don't pay attention, uh, pretend that you're not even here, okay? That's what high Z is trying to say. What about the zero? The zero is corresponding to the case when a DMUX does not have an enable. So in the case of a DMUX where uh, there's no enable pin, then every single output is always driving something. It's always trying to specify content. But if the output is not the one being selected, we'll just say, uh, why don't you just put zeros, you know, as the default value at the output. But there's no way to turn it off because there's no enable pin to specify, hey, you know, uh, you just don't do anything, just pretend that you're not here. There's no way to specify that if a demultiplexer has no enable pin. All right, no questions. So now we have this high Z down here, and we are asking, uh, so where is, what is this one corresponding to? It's corresponding to the false, you know, of this expression here. So the false of this particular expression needs both of the sub-expressions to be false, okay? So we need this to be false, we also need this to be false. So the first one being false means enable is indeed in the DMUX, is in the demultiplexer, and then the other one is saying, um, enable pin is disabled. So if you have a demultiplexer where it has an enable pin and it is not enabled, that means every single output is going to have the high Z value. Every single output is going to be in high impedance mode. It is as if the entire demultiplexer is not there. All right, so I'm going to ask you guys, you know, to see if there any, if, if there are any questions. I'm trying to borrow as much um, C code as possible to explain things that are potentially new to you. All right, so we have a question. Couldn't you connect sub ternary operator with an end? I'm not sure what you mean by end. I think it might have to be more uh, specific because I don't know what the end is supposed to replace or where it is supposed to go. Because there are two sub um, ternary expressions. We have one top one here. You can count the number of question marks. We got one here and then we got here and then we got one over here. So I'm just going to wait a little bit. So I'm not sure how you guys like um, the output of uh, Joplin. Okay, add an AND condition to the first ternary condition instead of that. Oh, you mean put one over here and specify um, so we have to specify this, you know, and say that Um, so what I mean is instead of instead of having a, a subternary condition, add an and clause to the first ternary condition. Um, wouldn't that work? Uh, probably. We have to specify. Um, okay, so let me let me think about it right now because I haven't thought about that. All right, so this part catches the case of um, if there's no enable or if there's an enable, it is actually enabled, then we do the following because it, it depends on what I is, whether I matches um, the selector value. And over here, this is happening if, there's, if there is an enable and it is off. 
And in this case here, it is basically also saying that there's an enable, but you are not the one being selected. So I'm not seeing any quick and easy way to change this condition to incorporate an end in order to save us this ternary expression down here. Because this ternary expression is specifying, you know, what if you are not being selected? And um, because in that case, it, it depends on whether uh, there's an enable pin or not. If there's no enable pin, then if you're not being the one selected, then you basically have to output a zero. You have to output you know, a known constant, which is zero as your output. But if there is an enable, then you have to output a high Z value. So I'm not really seeing any uh, quick and easy way, you know, say for having another variable that we create up here, you know, up here probably, uh, potentially that can save us, you know, one nested ternary expression. So. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think he means, and I don't know if this is possible, adding the I is equivalent to dmux dot cell. Could that just be in that same first statement. You mean put it here, putting it into the top level yeah. condition. Since you don't yeah. do anything in only that condition, everything takes place within nope. the internal okay. one. Okay, thank you, Maddie. Um, the the answer is no, we cannot because if we put um, this condition as an end condition all the way up here, you know, basically right after this portion here then we will still not be able to differentiate you know when a when an output is not being the one selected then we'll always output high z but in some cases when there's no enable we actually have to output a zero so we still cannot differentiate between those two cases if we incorporate this condition all the way up here as an end okay so if you if you put that the in the in the first condition and uh, put the third sub sub uh, trinary uh, operator on the uh, else clause of this this whole ternary operator, then you will save one ternary uh, condition. And well, we're we're having three ternary operations currently, right? Yes. If you put, if you put an and clause to the first one, and copy and paste the the third one to the else clause of the first ternary operator then you will save one ternary operation. Um, I think it might be best if you just show it in the text channel. Um, but we are, this does sufficiently specify the value, you know, what the behavior of the D multiplexer is, which is kind of the focus of the discussion. Now, I would love to look at an alternative way to express this, but it's not the focus right now. So if you want to, you know, um, show me that, that would be great. Oh, I think I think Terence has some idea in the expression e n in the mux question mark high z zero. The high z means when able exist, and it is on. Well, it doesn't say it's on. This simply means it is there. But because of what we have here, um, it means you know it has to be on too. So think about it. Okay, by the time we get to here. Um, we must have made this condition true. So to make this condition true, we must have at least one of these two conditions being true. So either EN is not in DMUX, which will make this entire thing true, or EN is in DMUX and it is enabled. So by the time we get here, uh, if this condition is true, then it is also automatically saying that EN itself is on. Not only is it a member of dmux, dmux.en is also true at that time. And then Terence is asking, why are we getting high Z when enable is on? Because we are not talking to you. No, not you, Terence, but we are not talking to you because in this case, this is the, this entire thing is the else corresponding to i equals equals to uh, dmux.select.select. .select. So we are talking about a port that is not being selected at that time. Okay, cool. And Richard is still typing, so I'm gonna wait for Richard's uh, 
text message before we move on. Oh, okay. All right. So I really don't doubt that that might be some alternative way of expressing this logic, you know, without using a triple nested um, ternary expression. Um, at this point, I am just not seeing how to do that. So we'll just leave it as is right now. Okay, we can use some of the lab time to kind of look into the alternative form of this expression here. But I hope the logic is clear. Basically, for each output port, you have to decide you know what you're going to do. So if um, if there's an enable and enable is turned on and you're not the one being selected, then you're put into high Z mode. Um, if there's no enable and you're not the one being selected, you output a zero. And if you are being selected and enable is on, then you're connected to the input. If you are, uh, if there's an enable and enable is off, then uh, you are also in high Z mode. So I guess I can see if I reverse the logic, okay, to determine when it's supposed to be in high Z mode, that might potentially help simplify the logic because uh, once I clear out all the reasons to become high Z, then we have only two things left, okay? Because if I'm selected, I output a Z. If I'm not selected, I output a zero. If I am selected, then I output whatever the input is. So that would be a two level of ternary expression but it would complicate one of the expression because now it has to capture uh, both cases of, you know, everything is not selected or uh, there's no, there's an enable, enable is off, which covers every single pin. And also the case when there's an enable, enable is on, but I'm not the one being selected. So that, you know, so we are basically trading complexity of the conditions versus the nesting level of the ternary expression. So one way or another, this one is, you know, it, it, it has the, the same kind of complexity, I think. All right, so have we sufficiently beaten up this dead horse? All right, and no actual animal has been uh, harmed in this process. No hamburger has been made. Yes, very good. The audience has spoken. All right, so now we talk about a decoder. <laughs> I think I got something close to that, but not quite the same. There you go. Who is that? That looks like Dr. Phil, but I'm pretty sure that's not Dr. Phil. Oh, Kevin from the office. All right. Yes. All right, so getting to a decoder is easy now because a decoder is basically a single bit demultiplexer with the input port permanently connected to a one. That's all. That is what a decoder is, okay? It's, it's just the same as a demultiplexer where the input is connected to a one all the time. So that's it. So now we're going to talk about the ALU and also the register bank, and we're not going to do it inside Joplin. Instead, now that we understand every single component of the of to tax toy processor, the rest is what they call self-documentation. So self-documentation refers to this mess here, because now we have actually talked about you know what is. Um, this is a NAND gate. I'm just randomly picking things to point out that we have talked about that already. We know this is a demultiplexer and it has an enable pin, okay? Because the little gray dot here, this gray dot is the select, okay? You know, every time you look at a demultiplexer or a multiplexer, whatever is under the gray dot is the selector. So if you have one extra pin, you know, at the lower part of the device, it is the enable. So this one does have an enable pin. This one does not have an enable pin. So you guys would go like, oh, okay, so we recognize most of these things here. This is a OR gate. This is a register. Um, the PC stands for program counter. It is a register. This is the instruction register. Uh, we have tons of tunnels around here because otherwise it's going to get very, very messy. Um, and then we got a RAM component up here. 
excuse me, and a ROM component down here. This thing here is a comparator, okay? You know, all it does is, is comparing, and you don't exactly need to know how this works. All it does is to compare the two inputs, and then if it does equal, then this line is going to light up and become a 1. So that's how we detect you know, that we are in a halt instruction. We have a gazillion splitter, or a splitter that splits to a lot of different ants over here, and another splitter down here. Um, let's see, what else do we get? We have a microcode pointer down here. Um, and the only thing we really haven't talked about is an adder, okay? But we have talked about what an adder is, okay? It has two inputs, two numbers to add. It has a carry in, which is corresponding to our K0. It has an output, which is corresponding to our sum. And it also has a carry out, which is corresponding to what we knew as K3 in the carry look ahead assignment. In other words, we should know everything now, okay? Every single component by itself is already understood. The rest, it's really just following the lines, following the components, find out which one worked is which one is doing what at a particular instant of time, and that's why I like this particular um, processor because at this point, technically speaking, I'm not saying you know practically speaking, but technically speaking, you know everything that you need to know to understand the inner workings of this processor. Now, I'm not going to step away and just kind of give you assignments and labs to do. I'm going to go through some pro a process of explaining, you know, how we figure out how instructions are executed. So this goes all the way back to the, the von Neumann, you know, the von Neumann um, architecture. It's like, how do we store instructions in RAM so that the processor knows what to do with the content of RAM known as instructions or opcodes? So that's what we're going to do now. Um, before we go there, okay, let me just check to make sure that there are no questions about the individual components. And someone may say, but Tech, we haven't really talked about this thing here. This is a new component. We haven't seen it. And this is also a new component. We haven't seen it. Well, that's because this one is the reg bank, okay? Because remember, you have three files that you have to download to make the processor work. This is the reg bank. This is the register bank, which is its own component. And this one here is the ALU, which is its own component. And the answer is yes, we haven't really talked about it, but that's because inside, when you go to view RegBank, now this is really important. Don't double click it, okay? If you double click it, it will open the RegBank outside of the context of what is surrounding it, which is not going to be very helpful when you're trying to do your lab or when you're trying to understand how the processor works. So if you want to understand what is inside the RegBank, but Within the context of what is surrounding it, you want to right click and then go uh, view RegBank. And this is what it looks like in the inside. I think this is the only place where we see a decoder. So a decoder looks exactly like a demultiplexer, except it has no input pin because the implicit input pin is always connected to a one. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, we got the four individual registers, and then we have two multiplexers, and we got some output pins, we got some input pins. We got four output pins here. These output pins serve no particular purpose other than enabling what we call a trace analyzer. We'll get to the trace analyzer in just a little bit. And then we got some input pins. We got this input pin. We got this input pin, which is enabling the, demo to, uh, the decoder. We have this input pin, which is a selector to select which one of the registers is supposed to be updated, and so on and so forth. What about the other thing? What about the, the ALU, which stands for Arithmetic and Logic Unit? That's what ALU stands for. So this is the ALU. We do the same thing. Uh, right click and then show ALU and this is what it looks like in the inside got a whole bunch of input pins got two demultiplexers got one uh, multiplexer here we have an adder we have a subtractor this is a right shifter okay the right shifter is exactly what the name implies it is doing the opposite of a left shift operation so for a you know, if you right shift by one position what that means is you're introducing a zero all the way to the left hand side of whatever value that is coming in through this wire, this top wire here. 
and then you're introducing one zero from the left hand side and move all the other bits you know to the right hand side by one and in the process you can lose um, bit zero because bit zero will be right shifted out of the value entirely so this is a right shifter this is a negator this is a basically just a not gate this is an and and this is an or so these are the six operations that the processor natively knows how to do we have an adder we have a subtractor we have a right shift operation we have bitwise not bitwise and and then bitwise or and that's it so the the text toy processor is really I wouldn't say the simplest possible design for a processor but it's pretty close so everything else that we do is based on these six operations that we're defining here okay Terence has a question what kind of things are we going to be doing and working on with tax toy processor yes we're going to write code for it what else are we going to do with it right this is called assembly language programming so at in week eight we are finally getting to the programming part of it okay so what did we do in the other eight weeks well we're setting up this whole thing i mean we are trying to set up what an adder does that's when we talked about the um the expressions okay x y q k and s okay remember all those rows and how we come up with the carry look ahead equations and stuff like that that is just to explain what is inside this thing over here and then the uh, borrow subtraction excuse me the subtraction with the borrow look ahead that explains the subtractor okay now we didn't i didn't quite get into um the right shift operations which is actually fairly easy to do once we understand what the register is and then we have negation, we have conjunction, and then we have disjunction. We, for the most part, we know what it, what are inside each one of these things. I didn't quite into the get into the logic of uh, the multiplexer and the multiplexer in terms of and or gates and not gates. You can find that you know fairly easily. Um, and then the next question is: Is all the coding done in the assembler spreadsheet that we used in the last lab? And the answer is yes. Isn't that exciting? I'm gonna. There we go. But it is actually kind of fun, um, you know, depending on you know whether uh, you are a person who likes to find out how things work, or whether you just want to continue to move on and you know, get your degree. Um, I'm definitely the former. Okay, I'd like to find out how things work, and that's why I teach this class the way I teach this class. Um, yeah. So anyway. Let's go find out, you know, how we actually execute certain instructions. Okay, um, but if you have any questions about the individual components, now would be a very good time to ask those questions. Now, you might have not realized that you have some questions, and later on you realize, go like, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what a right shifter is doing. Um, what are the flags? Oh, very good. Okay, that's a good question. But let me address what I just said a little bit earlier, and then I'll get to the flags. So if later on or at any point of time you ask, you're asking yourself, I'm not really quite sure how this works, okay? This being a specific component in LogiSim. I would suggest that, first of all, you read the uh, library reference because you know, that's a documentation that tells you what the component does, and then follow up with an experiment, okay? Follow up with a, an experiment like what, did, like what I did with the RAM component and the ROM component. Hook up a bunch of input pins and a bunch of output pins. The RAM component is the only one that is kind of tricky because the D port, the data port, is bidirectional. It can be output, can be input, and that's why we need a controlled buffer in order to make it work. But everything else, like a demultiplexer or a multiplexer, the input is always an input, you know, output is always an output. They don't have bidirectional pins. So from that perspective, you can just hook it up and then you can test how it works. OK, you read the documentation. You have a particular theory in your head about how it works, but you're not sure. So you experiment with a simplified circuit to just to verify your understanding. So that would be what, how, what I suggest to get, gain a good understanding of the individual components. 
All right, so getting to Richard's question, what are the flags? Okay, so we will start with flags that we are familiar with, which is the overall carry coming out of an adder and the overall borrow coming out of a subtractor. Okay, in other words, if this were a 3-bit adder, this would be K3. If this were a 3-bit subtractor, this would have been, what is it, T3. That's it. Okay, so what are we doing with these things? Well, C and B are tunnels, so the tunnels go to a particular place. I'll show that in just a little bit. And then over here, we have S out. This is the sign bit, by the way. So how do we get the sign bit? The sign bit is coming out of this multiplexer here. This multiplexer is basically the quote-unquote concentrator of all the, of the operation that we have selected. So this is always reflecting the actual output of whatever operation that we have selected. So whatever operation we have selected, um, see how we have a um, splitter here? This splitter is kind of lazy, okay? It has got one thing to do, and all it does is to connect bit 7 of whatever the input is to the single bit output pin here. In other words, we are looking at the output of the entire thing and say, hey, I want to single out bit 7, which is the most significant bit, to become S out, which is a tunnel, which we're going to use it in just a little bit. Then down here we have Z out. You know, this is what we call the Z flag. The Z flag is the output of a NOR gate. Okay, We are quite familiar with a NAND gate. This is a NOR gate, which is negated OR. So in order for a NOR gate to output a 1, we need all of its inputs to be zeros because it is the negation, not of um, input 1 or input 2 or input 3 or input 4 and so on. So we need every single input to be a 0 in order for a NOR gate to output a 1. So that means if Z out is a 1, that means, okay, I shouldn't say that. I should say Z out is a 1 if and only if every single input here are zeros, which also means the output of whatever operation we have chose to perform is also a zero. Okay, I'm going to take row and um, and then we'll continue with this discussion. So this is row taking for today. And the word I have chosen is mux, M-U-X, all lowercase. So I'm going to type it in the text channel, M-U-X for multiplexer. And then I'm going to release it now. Save and publish. There we go. So you guys have about 9 minutes and I would say maybe 30 seconds to do it. That's still plenty of time. All right, so I'm going to move this out of the way. All right, so Terence is asking, so MUX and DMUX help us pick out which operation we want to do and get the right output back. Well, when they are arranged like this inside the ALU, then you will be correct, Terence. Um, the best way to look at what a MUX or DMUX is, is this. Okay, I know this is going to look pretty um, silly, okay, pretty juvenile. But nonetheless, I think it is a very good and easy way to look at this. Okay, so I, we are going to take a look at the island of Sodor. Okay, there we go. And we'll look at some images and find the one that actually shows what I want to show you. Um, let's see, because I want to look at all the... This one, maybe this one, hmm. and maybe this one. We'll try this one. There we go. And this is from Wikipedia of all places. Wow, okay, cool. So we're going to take a look at the image all by itself and click it. There we go. All right. So I'm going to assume most people are now done with um, the row taking activity. So this is the island of Sodor. Okay, and you can probably pull up the subway map of New York City or, you know, the you know, subway system of any metropolitan area um, is going to have the same effect. But, you know, 
I choose the island of Sodor because it is fictional and it is kind of fun. You can buy toys, you know, for this. All right, so we got a bunch of lines. These are rails, okay? These are basically railroad lines. And we can see how, you know, right here, there's a junction. Right here, there's a junction. Um, and right here, there's a junction as well. So whenever there's a junction, what do you do, you know, with a railroad junction? Because it's not it's it's not really the same thing as you know a branch on the road. It is a rail, right? So you cannot just say you know um, I think we'll let the train decide you know, which way to go. That doesn't happen, right? Move the rail sideways or forward. So there, it's a it's called a switch. Okay, it's called a switch. So a railroad switch is basically what allows the critical selection. So. Um, railroad switches are not directional. In other words, you know, you know, <laughs> we wish they were, you know, directional. It it makes sense when we have one input and multiple outputs, right? You know, when the, in the in the case of a railroad, so that this way, you know, a train is incoming to a junction that has multiple uh, branches they can connect to. So the railroad switch is switched by a you know, operator, and then the operator will basically go, you know, okay, you know, there's a lever, okay, you know, pretty long because it needs a lot of leverage. So you have you have to push it one way or the other, in order to select one of two possible outputs for a particular switch. So if you, if anyone wants to look at a railroad switch in close up, this is what it looks like. Okay, so there you go. This is a pretty good picture of a railroad switch. So let me, there we go, another Wikipedia. So there we go. So this is a railroad switch. And let me ask you this, okay? Let me see if you guys are paying attention. According to this animated GIF, okay, is this a multiplexer or is it a D multiplexer? Which one is it? It is a D multiplexer. <laughs> Richard is right. <laughs> it is a D multiplexer because it has one single input and two possible outputs. Okay, so the switch is basically a mechanical device that will allow a train, an operator, to choose an incoming train to go to one of the two possible outputs, you know, as rails. All right. I'll be, I'll be good so far, you know, explaining what a demultiplexer looks like when it is a train switch. And then somebody's going to look at this and go like, but tack, this can only be, uh, N, has, N can only be one in this case, because it can only select one or the other track. So how do we make a multi, um, how do we make a two-bit uh, switch, you know, um, uh, in, in the case of a railroad? So what do you think it's going to do? We're going to nest, okay? Yeah. You know, so we we're, we're going to make a tree. I don't have my tablet with me today, um, but guess what? I can use LogiSim to illustrate this. Yeah, this is pretty exciting stuff. You know, being able to uh, use LogiSim to to specify how do we make a, a two bit, okay, two uh, selector bit demultiplexer out of a single bit the multiplexer the answer is as is actually quite simple okay so we're going to go to plexer and we're going to pick out a d multiplexer and we'll make sure that we only have one select bit and how many data bit is there you know doesn't really matter and in this case we will also have enable sure we'll have enable all right, so right now we have the ability to have one single input and two possible outputs but what if i want to do something Let's make it like one input and eight output. In other words, n equals to three in this case. Okay, so we're gonna actually go ahead and make the circuit here. So we have one input, one enable also as an input, and then we're gonna have eight outputs. And the quickest way to make eight outputs is um, select and paste. I mean, uh, select, paste, or duplicate uh, exponentially. So let me select both of these, control D, and then put it over here. I just want to make the spacing look right. Does that look right? Yep. And then select one more time, paste. Now we have eight output pins. I'm not going to even bother to label these things because that's not the point. So what do we do when this is the only thing we have? 
well, we uh, replicate it, right? So we duplicate to get one more here and one, whoops, come on, select, move it. There we go. Ah. All right, let's try it one more time. There we go. And then what do we do? We select again. <laughs> and then we duplicate it. Oh, okay, so. Okay, I'm going to use a higher precision pointing device. There we go. So when I said a higher precision pointing device, uh, I'm referring to my touch point thingy. It's the... Um, it's it's the thing that looks like an eraser on Lenovo keyboards. I think Lenovo is the only brand that makes use of the touch point these days. It's actually very good uh, once you get used to it, just like VI. Once you get used to it, it's pretty good. But before you get used to it, it's not that easy to use. There we go. All right, so now we got to hook up everything because we got all the components already. So we'll put, it, put one over here. <clears throat> All right, so this is the single input. And so we're going to connect the single input to the input of the top level demultiplexer. <sighs> OK, I did not control when to release the button very well. There we go. There. OK, so the first input, the first output, sorry, goes to this guy. And then I think some of you can see what I'm trying to do already, but that's okay. You know, it's just going to take a little bit more duplicating to get this whole thing done. You can kind of see that this is kind of like a toy for me. Logisim is a toy and tech is just plain. There we go, and now it is just a matter of hooking up all the outputs to its leaf node, to borrow the term from CISP430. Some of you may have taken that class already, and some of you may not. It's a interesting class to take. <laughs> okay, doesn't look good, doesn't look good, boo. Come on, there we go. Um, go ahead. Go ask your question while I'm busy doing something that just kills time. What do I think of the new Apple chips? I haven't really looked into it, so I can't really give you an opinion of any kind. Um, the only thing I have read up on those chips is it's using a 5 nanometer process, but that's really nothing new. All the uh, Snapdragons are also 5 nanometer at this point which is pretty amazing if you think about it, because um, it, I think I mentioned this already. Um, back in the 90s, people think that it would be physically impossible to make transistors any smaller than a micron. And you would be asking, so what is a micron? A micron is um, 1,000 nanometers. So we are now uh, 200th of a micron which was previously previous, blah, previously thought impossible. So this is the enable. Enable is going to be multi-dropped. So enable is going to be multi-dropped into every single one. So all of these would be enabled at the same time, which kind of makes sense, right? So, so we're going to have all the enable pins multi-dropped. So I'm just going to be, oh, okay, that's not a good place to do this. That, put it here. So we're going to make a bus well, not a bus, but a multi-dropped node here. I'm not really a big Apple fan, so I'm not following their chips <coughs> too much. But the Snapdragon's are already uh, 5 nanometers, so... Um, all the cell phones also have um, specialized uh, chips, or they have specialized components in the chip to do uh, neural net stuff. Okay, so the last part is very important. These are the select bits, right? So the select bits are not all connected to the same thing because we have 
uh, three levels of selection. So we have this one connected to one select bit, this one connected to another select bit, and this one also connected to another select bit. So now we have to specify another input pin, which is a three bit input. So this is going to be a three bit input pin. And we're going to need a splitter because we need each individual bit to go to the select of one each level of the multiplexers. So this is the part that does become sort of important and uh, we might need to pay some attention here. So we want a splitter. It's going to be a three-way split into... Um, it's a three-bit, three-way split. There we go. So we are taking every single one of the bit out of this input pin. And, okay, so now I'm going to ask you guys, okay, where do you think I should put bit zero? Um, I'll give you two choices here. Okay, should bit zero go here or should bit zero go all the way up here? Mm. Okay, let me also you know, indicate I would name this one to be output zero 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 and I'm gonna name this one output zero zero one. So given that, okay, and this is going to be output 110, and this is going to be output 111. So given how I name the output pins, and given this is the input pin, how should I hook up bit 0 of the select input for the, for the overall circuit? <clears throat> Okay, since no one is giving me an answer yet, I will show you the answer. It goes to the last one. Because this is the quote-unquote least significant bit. It chooses um, the last level of the multiplexer. Now, I'm going to finish this circuit, and you can test it. Okay, I'm going to test. I'm not going to test it, but you can. All right, so bit one goes to the middle level. So here's the middle level. Yeah, I know it looks kind of busy. There we go. And then this one is the most significant bit. It only got one place to go, which is at the root of the tree. So now we have a kind of complex but um, there's a lot of symmetric, there's a lot of symmetry to this particular circuit. So I'm going to say this circuit, guess what? This circuit is going to do exactly the same thing as, let me uh, give you, oh, okay, I just messed up here. Control D, and I have to be careful where I pick. Nope, doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't want to do it. All right, so let's try it one more time. Click, ah! Okay, I'm giving up, so I'm going to, there's another way to do it. I can do a control C and then a control V. <laughs> oh, this is, this may not work either. Ah, uh, nope. Uh, okay, so that's okay. Instead of cloning one, I can just go to here and actually pick out a demultiplexer, okay? So this entire circuit over here is really doing the same thing as a as one that has three select input bits. So I'm just comparing this portion here with this circuit over here. They do exactly the same thing. All right, so I hope this example is showing you, you know, that once we know how to make a one bit demultiplexer, you know, one select bit uh, demultiplexer, we can just stack it in a certain way to expand it as much as we want. The next one up is going to have four, imp four selector bit and 16 output ports. And then the next one is going to have five selector bit and 32 output ports and so on. So is this helping? Does this help people understand, you know, what a demultiplexer is? Okay, excellent. So a multiplexer is going the opposite way. Now, obviously, in the case of trains, you have to have four, you know, the various trains to stop before they enter the switch. 
and then by moving the switches a little bit, then you instruct one of the trains to go forward to go through the switches to the output of the collective switch. Okay, but the other trains will have to stop. So that's the one thing you know that is not exactly analogous when it comes to the circuitry, because in circuitry. Um, by default, you can only have one to connect to the output. But in reality, when you're dealing with trains, you can have train crashes if the trains do not stop before they enter the switch. So they can basically mess up the switch itself by trying to ram into it. All right, so are we good so far with you know what switches really are? They're basically just railroad switches or demultiplexers and multiplexers. They're basically basically equivalent to railroad switches except in a railroad switch there's no inherent direction whereas in the circuitry you know we do have you know directions where a demultiplexer has one single input and multiple output which is what this diagram is and then with multiplexers it's exactly the opposite we have multiple inputs and one single output so you can basically just take a mirror okay on you put a mirror over here and then look at the mirror image that becomes a uh, multiplexer all right, so I'm looking at the time. Let's go ahead and play with one instruction. <clears throat> and I'm going to take a look at, I'm not sure whether we have enough background information to do the next lab. So the next lab is LDST and LDI. I'm just going to take a quick look at this and see whether we have enough information or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can do it. Okay. Yeah, so I think we can do this one. All right, so what we'll do is I'm going to illustrate one single instruction, and we're going to take a look at the opcode table. The opcode table is very important. Um, so we go to the share folder again. Oh, right, I forgot to change the... Uh, There we go. So we go to the processor folder, and then we get to opcode table, which is this one. And there are documentations to what each instruction is going to do. All right, so, all right, so this time we're going to focus on LD, ST, and LDI. So what you want to do is to look up column B, which is known as the mnemonics. So a mnemonic is basically a symbolic name to make things easier for us to remember. Because without mnemonics, the way you're going to specify instructions is to specify everything in zeros and ones. Okay, You can do it, it's just a hassle. Okay, It's not easy to do. So as I said a little bit earlier, we're going to specify... So we're going to try out the ST instruction, which is this one over here. So the ST instruction, in terms of binary bit pattern, starts with 1, 1, 1, 1. So the most significant four bits are all 1s. And then we have two bits to specify register X, which is one of the four registers, A, B, C, or D. And then we have another two bits, Y, Y, to specify register Y over here. So the mnemonic looks like this, which is ST in parentheses Y, comma, X. But the operation, what we are trying to do, is we are dereferencing Y. So Y is being used as a pointer to point to a location in RAM. And then X is the one, as a register, is the one that is supplying the content to update that location. All right, so we're going to have, we're going to illustrate, I'm going to illustrate how this instruction works. Okay. So we'll go ahead and um, make a specific example, and this is when I can switch back to Joplin. And in Joplin, we're going to specify the operation that I want to perform. So let's talk about ST. Um, we use C and a comma B over here. Okay. So in assembly, you can also use slash slash you know for comment. So what this means is we are okay. Let me double check. <laughs> because I cannot remember why is the pointing to the destination okay and why is okay all right so basically we're using register C to point out to which location in RAM I want to update 
and it's going to receive the value of register B. <clears throat> and in this case, I'm going to use um, backtick here to specify this is actual code. Okay, because otherwise the, the asterisk is going to be absorbed and turn something into italic, which is not the intention of what I'm trying to do here. All right. So the first thing we want to do is to figure out what is the binary code corresponding to this. So we have 1111, which is the fixed part of the opcode of this particular mnemonic. This is called a mnemonic. It is slightly easier for us to understand. And then we need B to be register X. So if register A is 00, zero register B is going to be A01. And the last or the least significant two bits, okay, what we're trying to specify here is register YY, okay? And YY is specified, is trying to specify register C. And since B is 0, 01, Y, I mean, since B is 0, 01, C is going to be 1, 0. So we are looking at a binary bit pattern of 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 as the opcode corresponding to this specific mnemonic. And this is what it is supposed to do when the computer, when the processor executes this instruction. So the first thing we need to do first is to enter this into the RAM component in the processor. So we look at this and we look at this as a hexadecimal number. The most significant hexadecimal digit is F, which is the 1111. One, one, one. And then the least significant one is going to be a 6, which is corresponding to 0110 in binary. So F6 is the opcode of STCB, and what it's trying to do is to re use register C to point to A location in RAM, and then update it with the value of register B. So are we okay so far in terms of what it is supposed to do? Not so much how it is going to do it, but what it is supposed to do. Okay, so we are good. All right, so now we switch back to uh, the processor. And we have to go back to main of the processor. And Jonathan is correct. XX is 0, 01 to specify register B in the register bank. And then uh, YY is 10 to, to specify register C also in the register bank. So right now we are going to go to the RAM component and just inject this particular value. So when I use the word inject, I simply mean you know we are uh, shortcutting um, the whole process. We are not using the assembler, you know, just because, you know, hey, we know what the code is supposed to be. And the next one is going to be 0, 01, which is the halt instruction. Um, we got six minutes left. Okay, perfect. Six minutes is all I need at this point to show you how the processor works. Okay, this is actually, um, depending on what how you look at things, this can be quite exciting or it can be a little overwhelming. Well, at first it's going to be a little bit overwhelming. So the first thing we do is we start with the microcode pointer. Okay, so this is where everything starts. The microcode pointer is reset to 000, and that's just you know the default state of all registers. Every time we reset the processor, all the registers get reset to zero. So what are we going to do? Well, this is the starting point. We look at the output of the microcode pointer, which is used, which is connected to the address port of the ROM component. The ROM component is now addressing um, location 000. It is always enabled because the select of ROM is always connected to a one, so the ROM is always active. So now <clears throat> we are looking at the content of this location in ROM, which is 1080007, which is in hexadecimal. It's just a whole bunch of bits, right? You know, it is, um, I cannot remember the, the bit width of the ROM is 26. Okay, so there are 26 bits coming out of the D port of ROM. And all of these things are going to various places to specify what we should do at this point. And the way we analyze the processor is to find out which component is active, okay, which one is doing something, and how the components are connected if they're doing something. 
So we have to look at things that are active. The first one that I usually look into is the RAM component. So we want to see if the RAM component is active. So right here we see RAM cell is a 1, and that's coming out of the ROM. Okay, One of the bits coming out of the ROM is connected to the select of RAM. So now RAM is saying, OK, I'm awake. I'm paying attention. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. We also see LD of RAM is a 1. This is also coming out of the ROM. And it's specifying we are trying to do a read operation. We're trying to you know um, update. Um, no, take it back. We're trying to read um, from RAM. <clears throat> clear is a 0. That's usually the case. The only time clear is not going to be 0 is, is when we press this button here, which we're not going to do here. So when RAM is reading, we got two additional questions. The first one is, where are we reading? Who is telling us where to read? And then once we read the content, we also want to ask the question, who's going to be updated based on the output of RAM? So those are the two questions we need to ask now. The first question of why are we reading location 0? We have to track down A port. Okay, So A port tracks all the way back to a multiplexer. So this multiplexer has a select of 1, which means input 1 connects to the output. So now we have to track down input 1 of this multiplexer. And input 1 of this multiplexer goes to only one place that matters, which is the output of the program counter. Now, I understand it also goes to the input of this particular adder, but that's not really useful right now because the input does not specify the content of a node. All it can do is to read the content of a node. Only the output of a component can specify the content of a node. So the program counter is supplying the bits that we use to specify the A port of RAM. So that answers one of the two questions. The second question is, who is paying attention to the D port? So we now track down the D port. So the D port connects to a whole bunch of places. So I'm going to shortcut this discussion because you know I know exactly which one is supposed to be paying attention. It's the instruction register. So the instruction register has its D port connected to the D port of RAM, and we know the RAM is now driving the D port, its own D port, to, so that it shows the content. And we also know the instruction register is enabled, okay? because the enable pin is a 1. So that means on the next rising edge, the instruction register is going to update itself based on the output of RAM. Now, this, hoax, this goes all the way back to the whole idea of the von, uh, the von Neumann you know, uh, architecture. This is how we read an instruction from RAM to get it processed. Okay. So what do you mean by getting it processed? Well, let's, let's first perform you know, the, uh, the next operation that we need to do, which is a rising edge. Because right now, the clock is at a low state, is a 0. So I'm going to do a Control T on the keyboard to toggle the clock. So now it becomes a rising edge, Control T right there. And you can see how the instruction register becomes F6 at this point because we just saw it just saw a rising edge it is enabled and then the D port of the instruction regi instruction register is connected to the RAM component's own D port and the RAM component is in read mode and it, location 00 is being addressed Whew. okay so what now well if I control T again this is going to be a falling edge now the falling edge seems to be useless for all of the registers except for one the microcode pointer is the only register that is sensitive to a falling edge for a good reason. Okay, So if the microcode pointer is going to be updated because we're going to have a falling edge, we have to find out how it's going to be updated. So we have to track down the, its own D port. It comes from a multiplexer. The multiplexer has to select being a 1, which means we have to track down input 1. And input 1 is coming from an adder. And all this adder is going to do is to take the output of the microcode pointer at 1, which is our C in, and then the output is just 1 more than the current value of the microcode pointer. So that means on the falling edge, the microcode pointer is going to increment by 1, so that it will become 0, 0, 1. Yeah, that's OK, Daniel, because it's, this, this is all getting recorded. You can replay it um, and you know just kind of do it slowly, you know, replay it, pause often, and then you can you can still keep track of everything that is going on here. 
All right, so I'm going to do a falling edge, which is Control T. The micro code pointer becomes zero zero one. Yes, uh, on the falling edge. Technically, you know, the micro code pointer increments on the falling edge, but sometimes it doesn't increment. Sometimes it does something crazy. I, you know, we'll, we'll show that. So now you can see that you know ROM is um, uh, addressing another location. So the, its output is now changed. Okay, so the output of ROM, the D part of ROM has now changed its output, and the next control T is going to be a rising edge again. So that means all of the other registers can potentially be changed. We have to find out which one is enabled. So once again, we want to analyze what things are enabled and how they are connected. The, so you might want to write down a list of components to check. The first one I usually check is RAM, and RAM this time is not enabled. Okay, so if RAM is not enabled, we need to check some of the other components. So the other components would be the program counter. So we can see how the program counter is uh, enabled because its enable pin is PCEN, and PCEN is coming out of the ROM too. So we are basically specifying the program counter to say, hey, you're enabled on the next rising edge, update yourself. Um, uh, to view which tick. So you can look at the clock line. So when you look at the clock, it is low or it's a dark green right now, meaning it's, it's a zero. So we are just about to update registers in general because the micro code point is the only one that updates on the falling edge. All of the other ones would update on the rising edge. But in order for a register to update, you also need the, the enable of that particular register to be enabled. And PC, the program counter, is the only one that is enabled at this point. You can check the other ones. You can check the instruction register is not enabled, okay? but the program counter is enabled. So now we need to track down its D port. It's coming from a multiplexer. The and the select of this multiplexer is dark green, which means it is a zero. So we have to track down you know input zero, which is similar to what we saw earlier. It's coming from an increment. Um, it, it's coming from an adder to do the increment. Except the Harry in is not um, c uh, connected to a constant of one. It's connected to something that is one at this point. So we're not too concerned about why this is one at this point. We just know that, okay, it's one. So we're incrementing the program counter. So on the, on the rising edge here, the program counter is going to change from 0, 0 to 0, 1. Okay, so we're going to... I'm, I'm typing Control T on the keyboard, and we can see how the program counter increments from 00, 0 to 0, 01, and now the clock is high because I just transitioned the state of the clock. All right, so what is going on? What what is going on now? So the reason why we're incrementing the program counter is because we have quote unquote fetched the opcode from RAM already. So there's no reason for the program counter to stay at the location of 00. zero. We're setting up the program counter to get to the next instruction at this point. And that's why the program counter was auto-incremented. And the next tr clock transition is going to be a falling edge. So on this falling edge, um, the microcode pointer is the only one that is sensitive to a falling edge, so it's going to be updated. So now we have to track down the D port of the microcode pointer. It's coming from this multiplexer, but this time the multiplexer has a selector of zero, which means we have to track down input zero here. Input zero is a little bit funky because it comes from a splitter in reverse, which is a merger. Bit zero to three are zeros, and then bit four to bit 11 will be coming from the tunnel of instruction. The tunnel of instruction is coming from the instruction register, is coming from the output of the instruction register. So F6 is going to specify bit 4 to bit 11. Bit 0 to 3 are all zeros. So what that means is the microcode pointer will now update to F60. So let me do a control T and we can see how the microcode pointer is now updated to F60. Location F60 of the ROM specifies exactly what the ST instruction is supposed to do. I know we're going a little bit over time, but this is really, really important. So I'm going to finish this whole thing first before I um, decide whether we have enough time for the lab or not. I have, I think I might want to postpone that, but um, I'll decide in 
just a few minutes. But let me finish this first. So the content of location F60 is specific to opcode F6. So every single opcode has at, uh, has up to 16 locations in the ROM to specify what it's supposed to do. But this is the first step, which is also called a slice okay, in the microcode. This is a microcode slice. Now we're going to do the analysis again. Okay, We want to find out what components are active, what components are not active, and so on. So remember how I usually check RAM first? Okay, So we're going to check RAM. <clears throat> and we can see RAM this time is enabled because the select of RAM is a 1. We can also see that this is a right operation because LD is a 0. So now we got two questions to ask. Okay, So every single time RAM is active, we have two questions to ask. The first one is who is specifying the address? And the number two is you know who is either reading from the D port or who is writing to its D port. In this case, we want to ask who is driving the A port, who is specifying the address. And now we also want to know who is um, driving the D port. Now the instruction is interesting only when the registers are not all zeros. So we're going to change the register, registers. This is one thing you can do is to change you know, the content of re the registers to anything you want uh, during the testing of um, whatever process you're testing. So we're going to change register C, which is controlling you know, which location we want to go. And we can change it on the fly. So we can now specify, let's update this to location uh, 9E. And register B is, is controlling, according to the instruction, you know, what content should go to location 9E. So we're going to change it to, oh, let's say, you know, F5. Okay. So we just did the change on the fly, just so that the operation is a little bit more interesting. So when we go back to main, you will find that the address location is now F, this is FC, this is FD, and this is FE. So Oh, so that means we should be able to track the A port of RAM all the way back to register C, right? And now let's go find out how we can do that. So we go to the uh, multiplexer. The multiplexer has a selector of 0, so now we have to track down input 0. Input 0 is coming out of this D multiplexer. This demultiplexer has a select of zero, so paying attention to output zero is the correct thing to do. But now we have to use this line or this node to uh, look up what is what is out one coming out of the register bank. So now we use a right click and view reg bank. This is out one. Okay, this is out one, and we can see out one is coming from a multiplexer. This multiplexer currently has a select of 1, 0. So we look up its inputs. Input. This is input 0. This is input 0, 1. This is input 1, 0. So input 1, 0 is indeed connected to the output of register C. So now we have explained how register C inside the register bank is ultimately connected to the A port of RAM. Second question. Second question is, how do we know register B is the one connected to the D port? In other words, we track down the D port of RAM at this point. So we track this down, and we go like, oh no, this is connected to a lot of places. Well, fortunately, most of the things that they connect to are disabled. So um, I'll give you some examples. You can see how the instruction register is now disabled. You can see how the program counter is also disabled. So most of the things it connect to are disabled. But it also connects to this D multiplexer here. This D multiplexer does have an enable pin, but that enable pin is a 1, which means we are we have enabled this D multiplexer. And now we want to look at the selector. The selector is 1, 0. This is input 0, 0. This is in this sorry, this is output zero zero, this is output zero one, and this is output one zero. So we are now paying attention to the right output of this demultiplexer. So now we have to track down okay, who is feeding information into this demultiplexer? It is an output pin called out zero from the register bank. So now we have to track down what is inside the register bank that connects to out zero. So out zero is this is this output pin here. So we track this down, 
and it, we, it connects to a multiplexer. This multiplexer has a selector of 0, 1. This is input 0, 0, and this is input 0, 1, and we can see how input 0, 1 of this multiplexer does connect to register B. So now we have established that register B connects to the D port of RAM, and the register C connects to the A port of RAM. So now going back to the main circuit, <clears throat> and we are ready for a rising edge. So clock is now dark green, which is a zero. So the next control T is going to be a rising edge. So we can now expect location FE to be updated to a new content of F5, okay, right here. So I'm just going to type control T on the keyboard at this point. Control T and voila, it just updated, okay, which is great. And now we're ready for a falling edge. So whenever we have a falling edge, we can forget about all the registers except for the microcode pointer. So the microcode pointer is going to be affected by the next falling edge. <clears throat> so now we have to track down its D port. It's coming from a multiplexer. The multiplexer has a selector of 1. So now we have to track down input 1 of this multiplexer, which is coming from the auto increment mechanism. So we are only going to location F61. Except we have a little problem here. Because when we get to location F61, it's not going to stay there for too long. So let's find out why we're not going to stay too long at location F61. Because F61 has a very interesting um, pattern. <clears throat> to answer Ben's question, I have not decided yet. So stay on the Discord channel for now. All right, so we're going to go to F60 first and then find out what it is. So I'm just using the scroll to scroll down to F60. This is F60, and then F61 doesn't look too suspicious. It just has a 2 and then followed by all zeros. And this 2, by the way, specifies the most significant bit, or bit 25 of the output, becomes a 1. Okay, so what is the significance of that? <clears throat> well, when you look at the output here, this is bit 25, which is the most significant bit, which is going to become a 1. Okay, since it's going to become a 1, it is connected to a to, to uh, one of the inputs of an OR gate. So that means the output of the OR gate is also going to be a 1. Now, it has not happened yet. Okay, If I have another transition, a falling edge, that's going to happen. But see where this node is connected to. It's connected to the reset of the microcode pointer. Can someone point out what happens when the reset of a register becomes a 1? What does it mean? And why, why is this labeled 0? All content becomes zero. Richard is correct. So this is going to take, it, it, you won't be able to see the microcode pointer getting to location F61 because in a very, very, very short amount of time, it becomes all zeros. Okay, so I'm going to do control T right now and becomes all zero, zero, zero. What does that mean? We have just completed one execution cycle of the processor. Okay. Um, I'm going to write this in my Joplin because I think this is going to be useful. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so the microcode pointer is zero, and we have a rising edge. This is called the fetch cycle. In other words, we are taking um, the content of one byte of RAM and then put it into the instruction register. Okay, so we're going to use, um, <clears throat> okay, this is, IR is instruction register, becomes whatever the program counter is pointing to. And I'm going to have to quote the whole thing because otherwise the asterisk does not show up. This is the uh, fetch cycle. And then the next thing that's going to happen is we are going to have a falling edge. Okay, the micro cool pointer is stu but will still be zero and then we have a falling edge. And then we have a falling edge. This particular what step has no particular name. All we do is to uh, increment um, the microcode 
pointer. Basically, we're just getting ready for the next thing to do. So no particular name in this case. <clears throat> and then in the next step, we have the micro code pointer being one. And once again, we have a rising edge. So in this specific case, we have the auto increment of the program counter. It also does not have a specific name. You know, we are just getting ready for the next um, instruction, you know, to read the next instruction in RAM. And then the next one is the micro code pointer being one. And then we have a falling edge. This one is important. It is um, the actual operation is the micro code pointer is getting um, the instruction register left shifted by four bits. That is what we are doing here, but it has a name. This name is called decode. In other words, we are decoding the opcode to find out you know, which location in ROM is going to tell us what it is supposed to do. And then the next one is the microcode pointer becomes <clears throat> uh, whatever the opcode is, opcode uh, left shifted by four, and this is execute. In other words, now this one, there's no um, general description to say what it's going to do because it all depends on what opcode we are talking about. What we have just seen, okay, let me switch back to the processor. So what we have just seen here is one complete instruction execution cycle, but the execute part is executing the STBC instruction. And that is very specific because we are storing to a location in RAM that is pointed to by register C and we're going to use the content of register B to update that location. That is a very specific pathway. Um, I know we are going over time. Um, I think we're going to postpone the lab because I want to use one more lecture to talk about the LD and the LDI instruction. Then, you know, when you do the lab, everything will be in, in uh, much better context. But that also means I'm going to extend <laughs> this lecture just a little bit more, just a little more. <clears throat> because I wanted to show you, because we have just looked at a lot of pine needles. And sometimes it's helpful to get out of the pile of pine needles and just kind of step back and look at the pine tree and kind of look at how this pine tree fits in the forest. So what we have just observed is this component here, okay, the ROM, the microcode pointer, and various logic connected to this part here, that's the conductor, okay? This is the conductor, and this is, is, this is the orchestra, okay? This portion here is the orchestra. So the clock is basically the basic beat, okay? You know, whenever the conductor you know, flips the wind, it is indicating a beat, and that's supplying the timing information for every single component of the entire processor. However, the processor, I mean, excuse me, the ROM, which is the conductor, this whole mechanism is the conductor. The conductor is also telling which component should be paying attention and which component should stay quiet and how the components are going to be connected. How things are connected is determined by the multiplexers and the demultiplexers. Which component is active is, con is controlled by the enable pin of the registers and also the select pin of the RAM. In other words, each ROM location contains the 26 bits in order to, to specify the pathways between the components and also to indicate which component should be active and paying attention and doing something and which one should stay inert and say, okay, let's just pretend that you're not even here. Don't do a single thing. That is how instructions execute. So let me catch up on the text channel here. Um, so F61 is there for a very, very brief moment of time and we could not see it. But if you look at it from an oscilloscope, you might catch a glitch, okay? You know, what looks like a glitch because it happens so fast. Um, Richard is correct. All content are zeroed out because of that falling edge. 
And then Colton says it should be it should reset the register. Yes, that is true, and that's why the micro cool pointer went from F61. Technically, it's F61, but you could not see it. But it went all the way back to 000, zero because of that. All over my trampoline. Okay, leaf blower. Okay, so micro cool pointer is the conductor. Uh, the micro cool pointer is more like. It's more like a pointer pointing to which bar of the music we should be playing, kind of like that. Okay, I wouldn't say exactly like that, but it's kind of a pointer on the music of the conductor to indicate what is the next bar to play, and then based on that bar, okay, the conductor was would first you know, supply the basic beat information, but also at the same time point to the section of the orchestra and say, you guys, okay, you need to play this time, and you guys need to stay quiet. You need to, yeah. Uh, and then Richard said, okay, that's it. Yep. So, um, so at this point, okay, going through this exercise once, okay. <clears throat> I know this is all new to you. You know, finding out where the components are, you know, what things can respond, and so on, may take a little bit of time. So I suggest that you make a list. Okay, make a list of things that can potentially do something or not do something. Um, all the registers would belong in that category because a register with the E and being a one means it can update on the next rising edge, save for the micro cool pointer, which is the only one that updates on the falling edge. So find all the registers, make a list, and then there's the RAM component, right? So the RAM component is also a component that can do something, except this one is a little bit more complex. It can read or write. Okay, so those are the starting points. Okay, things that can do something. And then the next thing would be the connectivity between, you know, the registers and RAM. The connectivity connectivity are basically determined by the demultiplexers, and also the multiplexers. Now those I wouldn't make a big list of those things because you know we can always follow the things that are active and then go ask the question at that point. For instance, if the program counter is enabled. Only at that point you have to follow the D port and find out what is being used to update the program counter. When the RAM component is in read mode, okay, you want to find out who is paying attention to the D port of RAM. When the RAM component is in write mode, you want to find out which component is supplying the content to update RAM. So I wouldn't worry too much about the multiplexers and the demultiplexers. I would only look into those once you have identified what components are active. All right, so this is a very—I know this is a very lengthy lecture, but considering that I'm not going to give you the lab for today, hey, you know, it's not—it's not a bad use of time. So just because there's no lab doesn't mean that there's nothing for you to do. Okay. So the one thing for you to do is to look into some of the other instructions. Okay. I will pick out a few easy ones for you to try out in this entire process. Okay. See if you can follow what the processor does when you execute that instruction. So let me get back to the upcode table tab table. Where is that? Right here. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> so I want you to kind of track down, track down the easy ones. Okay,、um, increment is one. Okay, so increment is one that's kind of fun to do because all it does is supposed to、um, add one to a particular register. So I would track this one down.、Um, just say increment B. Okay, you'll see how it's going to update register B, so it becomes one more than what it used to be.、Um, and I would also look into Maybe just subtraction. So subtraction is up here. Okay, this is subtraction.、Um, so you can find out, you know, how the pathways between the registers and the ALU are established in order to perform a subtraction that stores the difference back into register X in this case. And also, you know, if you say I don't have time to do any one of this, I would say、um, try the LD instruction. So the LD instruction is up here. So the LD instruction is exactly the opposite of this ST instruction. The LD instruction is reading from the location in RAM pointed to by whatever the Y register is, which is 
re a register A, B, C, or D in the register bank. And then the content at that location would then be stored in register X, which can also be one of the four registers in the register bank. X and Y, by the way, can be the same. You can use register A or B or C or D to both specify where to read in RAM and also to get the content of that location in RAM. So that would be the thing I want you to do like now. Okay, you know, take a short break, come back and and try to go through the very same process that I did, except with a different instruction. Um, the recording of the lecture is already up on YouTube. It has always been, okay, because it's a live stream. So I would kind of go back to what I did, okay, and then you might want to jot down some notes on your own, okay, so that you can kind of explain the process that I did for each step, okay. And you don't have to do it in full speed, okay. You can always just kind of replay the YouTube at lower speed. I think that's possible because my daughter always do it at a faster speed, okay. So don't do it at a faster speed, you'll know, do it at a slower speed. And then pause, okay. You know, whenever I get something done and you understand, pause, jot down some notes, and then you do your own analysis of whatever instruction you choose to test. All right, now just because there's no lab doesn't mean that I'm going to walk away and have free time. I'm going to be here. I will be um, sitting next to my computer and watching my text channel. So for those of you who want to give this a try and you have any additional questions, I'll be here to answer your questions. All right, so I think this is a good time to end the lecture. So there's no lab today, okay? Just to repeat myself, there's no lab today, no official lab that counts for any points, but I would like you to do what I just suggested you to do because this is still fresh in your head and it's a good time to do it before you start to forget about what I just said earlier in the lecture. Yes, so Jonathan is correct. I would look into increment. Decrement is about the same as increment, so I can you can skip decrement. If you understand increment, decrement is like, oh, okay, it's about the same thing. But LD is a good one to test. And with all of these, you might want to change the registers. You'll change whatever register you're using for those instructions. So they don't start with zero, zero, because otherwise it's just going to be boring. Okay, so you might want to try to change the registers that you are going to use in those opcode to something else, then you can actually observe. You can potentially also change the content of RAM to something else, just so that you can say, okay, I'm reading 00, zero into a register that already has 00. zero. I have no idea whether it worked or not. So don't do that, right? You go to the RAM component, force a particular location to change to some other content, and then uh, work with the registers so that you point to that location and then try to read that content into a different register. So that way you can verify, you know, all of the various aspects of the execution phase of that instruction. Oh, one, when you're doing this, also, you know, you might want to, and I can publish this if you guys want me to do it, <clears throat> I can publish this. So you might want to identify these phases, okay? You know, particularly the fetch cycle. I'm going to even highlight these things, okay? So the fetch cycle is important because this is where we get the opcode into the processor for further processing. The decode is also important because this is when we tell have the processor to say, okay, just look at what you read earlier, okay? You know, do you know what you're supposed to do with this? And then the next phase is execute, which is looking up the location in ROM that's very, very specifically say how things are supposed to be connected in the rest of the processor and how they're supposed to be in, well, okay, I just said that, how things are interconnected and what components should be active. That is the execute. So while you're going through the same exercise, you know, just try to identify, oh, I'm doing a fetch right now, I'm doing a decode right now, and I'm doing execute right now. Um, so that is all I have to say. Um, does anyone want to have this thing here? Does anyone want to have what I have in Joplin? Because I can quite easily export that to HTML. You would like the Joplin doc itself. I'm not sure whether I can do that. Let me see if I can do that. Um, I can export, I can export to Joplin export file. Okay, so you can have the Joplin file. Nice, nice. Okay, I think this is probably the best way to do it is just to export the uh, the Joplin file. 
And for those of you who say, but I want the HTML, well, go ahead and install Joplin and then import the uh, JEX file and then you have the whole thing. The nice thing is when you have the whole thing, when you have the Joplin file itself, you can make your own changes. And then, of course, some of you, yes, I know I said a long time ago that I would stop the lecture, <laughs> but I'm going. If you guys want to leave, go ahead and leave. Okay, you know, this is not exactly the content of assembly language programming, but I'm still yakking. Um, if you're thinking that you don't want to subscribe to joplinapp.org, you know, to get their cloud service, you don't have to, because all uh, because you have your apps.losreas.edu account. Oh wait, that won't work, because that's Google Drive, because I have Outlook, so I automatically have a OneDrive, so you have to find a place to stash that file. Oh, okay. <laughs> we gotta change here. Okay, fine. You know, we're gonna up, uh, export to something else. Well, PDF always works. HTML always works. MD is Markdown that usually works. So I'm gonna export it in several different formats, um, and you guys can choose whatever you want. Um, I think HTML is a pretty safe bet here. All right. Okay, so that should be exported. All right. <clears throat> Oh, okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to stop the streaming and also the um, 